governments and industries all around the world are looking to migrate the use of energy from the burning of fossil fuels to the use of electric vehicles. The use of physically dense battery cells increases the weight and challenges automotive makers to seek weight efficiency where possible. One such method is the novel use of newer and lighter um, alloys, such as strengthened aluminum alloys. The joining of said alloys is a challenge we'll discuss today. And with the demand set, we'll be discussing at a high level how to optimize aluminum metallurgy for GMO welding and fatigue life. Today I'll be going over the uses of aluminum in history, the strengthening processes that we can use to push aluminum to its limits, uh, the effect of welding on these properties, as well as the estimated fatigue life, which is the goal of this uh, presentation. Aluminum has recently become a competitive structural component to rival that of steel. Uh, aluminum alloying and tempering allows for replacement of heavy steel components. We can see a trend of OEM uh, manufacturers moving to aluminum for both uh, outer panels as well as the full uh, chassis structure, as seen with the Ford F-150 and Tesla Model S. And it's no surprise that many industries are starting to love aluminum. Uh, we can see that recycling aluminum uses just 5% of the energy of raw refining. Um, I will notice in this particular instance, aluminum has no endurance limit, which means, unlike steel, it has a set lifetime during its use. However, as you can see, we can simply recycle the material once we're done with it. Uh, it has many other favorable uh, traits, including the abundancy here on Earth, uh, its low density, which is again why we're discussing it, excellent corrosion resistance, uh, a big plus when you're manufacturing vehicles in Canada, uh, high workability and machinability, uh, and high electrical conductivity as well as thermal conductivity. Here we can see an outline of the different types of aluminum extrusions. Uh, we can talk about aluminum castings at a later date. Uh, aluminum casting theory will also come into the solidification of aluminum, uh, but here I want you to pay attention to the different uh, series of extrusions. We have eight, mostly segregated by their alloying elements, uh, with various uh, metrics for uh, weldability. Here we can see we're going to focus on the 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 series, um, as 7,000, 8,000, and 2,000 are categorically non-weldable without future resource, uh, research. Uh, we can also notice that the 6000 series is heat treatable. I want you to pay attention to that later. Uh, on the left, we can also see the different heat treatment options. Uh, these are just a few of the broad categories. We can go into much de uh, deeper detail later on. We discussed earlier that aluminum is starting to rival steel in strength. How does this come about? Well, strengthening is a summation of multiple factors happening at concurrent stages. Uh, while we'd like to apply all these at once to get the maximum uh, critical strength, uh, we will see they'll be activated at different times. But in general, we see uh, frictional stresses just due to the uh, friction between atoms. We see the ground, grain boundaries of polycrystalline materials, so essentially um, how each subset of atoms stacks up together with uh, misorientation angles. We see uh, strain hardening. Uh, some of you may have been familiar with uh, cold working. Um, Within welding, this process won't be used generally, but uh, it is another way of uh, introducing um, dislocation density or basically um, a stack up of a strain field uh, to harden the material. We also see uh, solid solution hardening. This is the main factor for non-heat treatable aluminum. So essentially you're adding alloys uh, into the vacancies or interstitially in the uh, aluminum structure until you saturate the material, uh, similar to adding salt into water. And lastly, we have precipitate hardening. Essentially, you're forming small, fine points throughout the grain structure to further resist the material. This is an extension of solid solution hardening, but is a characteristic of heat-treatable uh, aluminum alloys. We will see that precipitation strengthening is the major driver, especially for 6000 series aluminum, for achieving the high strengths that we're looking for. Um, we can see uh, on the left you have the aging time and temperature curve. We essentially heat the material into a solution, uh, quench it rapidly. That forms our primary structure. You can imagine 
uh, aluminum crystals form. From there, we increase the temperature to the point where um, the solutes or the other elements will basically uh, start to melt and uh, diffuse throughout the system. Uh, throughout that aging time, they will diffuse, and then again, the heat, um, the temperature will be reduced until you have a series of fine participates. Uh, on the top left, you have the uh, you have the characteristic change of the precipitates uh, from the general GP zones, which are shaped as a spherical, uh, to a then uh, coherent particles, and then you are looking to ultimately end at incoherent uh, precipitates to maximize the strength. Uh, again, looking at the tempering grade, this would be known as a T6 temper. Many of you probably have seen this in industry. It essentially means that you have your maximum um, strengthening from precipitations across the many different mechanisms. This is a busy slide, but we'll walk through it piece by piece. Uh, we can see that as we input heat from a welding process, we are effectively um, both melting the metal as well as the precipitates that we carefully formed for our 6000 series aluminum. Um, on the left, you can see a traverse of a hardness plot from the weld material, or from the base material, all the way through the weld material back to base material. You can see a significant drop of hardness values. This is mainly due to the changing microstructure in the actual welded material. Looking on the right, we can see what's happening. Uh, as you input the temperature, we're creating dissolution of all the precipitates that we carefully um, shaped within our annealing or within our aging process. And here uh, we can see we do get back some of the structure. And there are many processes or post-processing methods such as post-weld aging to try to bring back these uh, precipitates. But at its core, as we input our welding heat, we are dissolving our strengthening mechanisms for aluminum. It is also worth noting that during this process, any carefully controlled grain refinement or um, careful control of the initial grain size will be lost as you input heat. Uh, the annealing process is broken into three stages, and after recrystallization, we do have the grain growth stage. So we can look at our our grains expanding throughout the the input or the heat input. A joint can fail in many ways, either under a static load with crack initiation or under a general or slower um, fatigue failure, either at high cycle or low cycle. Essentially, over its lifetime, this joint will see a cycle of loads and at some point will fail from that. Uh, we can control the fatigue life by looking both at the microstructure and controlling defects as well as just getting a general sense from the ultimate tensile strength of the, the joint. We've already seen that the ultimate tensile strength is reduced by the dissolution of precipitates, especially for our 6000 series aluminum. We can also see that the alloying composition um, can either make the joint brittle or can introduce crack initiation, basically by having a misfit or a huge size difference of the uh, solid solution particles. Essentially there, we're going to be watching to optimize the filler wire to both have a similar melting profile to the parent material, as well as having um, a close chemical composition to the uh, parent material, such that you don't introduce new particles that degrade your mechanical performance. We can also see some of the defects uh, that reduce fatigue life. Uh, we can see porosity. Essentially, aluminum um, reacts heavily with the uh, hydrogen in the air, and if you don't shield it properly, as the aluminum is solidifying, uh, it will try to expel the hydrogen that's dissolved in the system and will create pockets of air. Essentially, this acts as a notch that um, is a propagation point for cracks. We can also see intradendritic uh, defects. Essentially, you will hear that aluminum is common for hot cracking, Essentially, what you can see here is uh, the formation of liquids between the aluminum dendrites. Uh, you'll learn more about that later on, but all you need to know is that uh, hot cracking affects all aluminum samples, and you want to avoid it by, again, matching the filler wire correctly uh, and avoiding uh, 
second solution or er, solute uh, mismatches. And lastly, there are other geometric parameters that we can discuss at a later time. All right, thank you so much for sticking with me. Uh, this material has been rated by peer-reviewed second years as slightly difficult, uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, we can see that aluminum is viable for structural components when you use its proper strengthening mechanisms. <laughs> the main one here in my favorite is precipitation. We can see that um, our processes are highly dependent on heat input and cooling time. So we can look to optimize weld fatigue life with controlled heat input by reducing the heat affected zone and with post weld heat treatments to try to bring some strength back into that aluminum. All right, thank you so much and have a great day.